Thelemic Orders. That's today's chapter, chapter 12 of The Magic of Aleister Crowley. Now, just because uh, I am a proud member of uh, uh, several Thelemic organizations and am in uh, somewhat in a leadership uh, uh, situation of uh, Ordo Templi Orientis, uh, this book and these broadcasts and everything I do uh, is my own take on things, all right? So I, I'm not uh, uh, speaking with my hat on uh, with either my uh, uh, OTO hat on or my Freemason hat on or my Scottish Rite hat on or my AA hat on. I'm speaking just as Lon Duquette, okay? Uh, I wrote this book, or I started writing this book, and wrote, wrote this chapter way back in 1983 or so, or excuse me, 1993, and uh, uh, many things in the world and many things in the magical world have changed and evolved. Uh, I've left this chapter just as, as it is, as I originally wrote it. And uh, it's pretty much, I feel pretty much the same uh, right now. Uh, but that being said, it starts off with a little epigram here from Libra 61, Velcase. In all systems of religion is to be found a system of initiation, which may be defined as the process by which a man comes to learn that unknown crown. Though none can communicate either the knowledge or the power to achieve this, which we may call the great work, yet it is possible for initiates to guide others." Unquote. Before I began to organize the material for this handbook of rituals, I look back over my 30 years to when my struggle to study the magic of Thelema began. It was as if I was thrust into postgraduate work without ever finishing grammar school. I was singularly fortunate to make contact with several of Crowley's personal students who were kind enough to answer my questions and offer encouragement and valuable suggestions. I learned that there is a step-by-step -step approach to the subjects, and I have endeavored to organize the material in this text along the same linear line, linear scale. Even though this is by no means a complete compendium of the rituals of Aleister Crowley, I'm hopeful that it will be a valuable tool for both beginning and advanced students. Because of my association with Crowley contemporaries, I'm often asked if it is necessary to affiliate in a, with an organization in order to become a Thelemic magician. This question invariably disappoints me because it re reveals that the querent is fundamentally ignorant of what it means to be a Thelemite. No, one does not have to join any organization, society, order, club, association, fraternity, collegium, lodge, chapter, temple, coven, tribe, party, league, fellowship, union, guild, team, troop, or pact to be a Thelemite or practice Thelemic magic. There is no law beyond do what thou wilt. The very term Thelemic organization seems to be an oxymoron. A collection of militant individualists all endeavoring to do their own will. This sounds like a recipe for chaos. 
and in many instances it is precisely that. Yet, Crowley seemed inspired by the thought of a new aeon society that could merge the precepts of complete personal liber liberty with the necessities of self-imposed spiritual disciplines. He experimented along various lines, but finally settled on two orders which he hoped would flourish in the millennia following his death, the AA and the OTO. Under the heading AA, and as, as we know, if you don't know already, the AA is written like that. There we go. With uh, an upright triangle of three dots after each A. So it's A, A. The AA was founded, well, let me uh, go to the footnote here because the footnote's important. It is commonly believed that AA stands for Argentinum, Argentinium Astrum, or Silver Star. I have been informed in no uncertain terms that this is not the case. And if I was writing this today, I would, I would say, uh, and I've also been informed in no uncertain terms that it is. <laughs> but there, there are various things that uh, people uh, say what it is. We didn't actually hear it from Crowley what it means. The AA was founded in 1907 by Crowley and George Cecil Jones, based on the classic Rosicrucian grade system of the Golden Dawn, AA requires the magician to actually achieve the states of consciousness and powers embodied in each of the ten Sephiroth. For example, the magician is only an adeptus minor when he or she has actually achieved knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. The AA is not a lodge system and is entirely secret. It is a testing order, not a teaching order. The aspirant officially knows only one person in uh, uh, one person in the order, his or her superior. Now these are the ideal uh, situation as Crowley and uh, envi envisioned it, whether it would ever be a practical thing or not. Uh, he didn't know, <laughs> I think. So the aspirant officially knows only one person in the order, his or her superior. Each magician is, for the most part, left alone to do the work as he or she see f sees fit. Ideally, contact with the superior is brief and infrequent and can be characterized as being suggestive rather than instructive. Advancement to the next grade is simply a seal upon attainment. The superior is at least one grade ahead of the aspirant and is theoretically capable of recognizing the initiatory level of his or her student the superior is answerable to their superior, etc. After a certain level of attainment has been successfully achieved and recognized, the aspirant can then take on a student and become part of the chain. While Crowley was alive, it was obvious who was at the top of this chain. And though the practical did not always align with the ideal, one could reasonably could be reasonably confident in the system. Since his death, matters have become more confusing. The present situation is basically this. And remember, this is back in 1993. Today, there remain a number of individuals who had 
a formal AA relationship with Crowley or one of several of Crowley's students. Some of these individuals have chosen to continue to take on students, who in turn have taken on students and so forth. As the nature of these relationships are secret, there is no way short of affiliation to gauge the quality of the magical work done. There are also a number of publicly advertised AAs and groups hinting they are the doorway to the AA, which, may, uh, which one may contact simply by answering their magazine ad. So in 1993, there were magazine ads uh, for it. I haven't seen one lately, though. As Crowley stressed the privacy of the system and particularly, uh, and particularly prohibited the exchange of any money on pain of uh, immediate expulsion in connection with the AA, I tend to view such groups with a level of skepticism. While I have no reason to doubt the sincerity or the competence of the individuals in either of the above categories, I must caution the reader against putting too much emphasis upon pedigrees and paperwork. The real work is always accomplished by the aspirant alone. More often than not, the student learns in spite of the teacher's efforts to help, not as the result of it. Answers will come as soon as the student is wise enough to formulate the question. There is no reason to wait for an adept to appear and make the great work easier for you. Anyone who is serious about AA affiliation can immediately begin the work by reviewing the prescribed material, mapping out a regimen of study and practice, and setting to work. If there is any validity to the concept of secret chiefs, such a display of determined sincerity will most certainly attract their attention and form the required inner plane contact. A bit of patience and tenacity is often required to locate a flesh and blood contact. But rest assured, they're out there. The reader is cautioned, however, against casually boasting of one's AA position or achievements if one is not indeed affiliated with the AA. Such pretense is likely to create a stumbling block to a bona fide affiliation, and also is just bad manners. Excerpts from One Star in Sight, that's a Crowley thing, from you'll find it in Theory and Practice in Book 4. Excerpts from One Star in Sight follow, which provide a basic outline of the structure and duties of the graded system of the AA. And briefly, it's like this. At the top is the order SS. Three grades. And they come down the, uh, or, uh, down the tree of life uh, from one. So it would be one, two, and three. And that would be the grades of Ipsissimus, right at the top. And even though it's the first sefer, it's called 10 equals 1. Because you've gone 10 steps up to get there, okay? So it's 10 degrees equal 1. And that 1 is usually shown with a little cube uh, uh, superscripted uh, past the number. So it's, well, let's, I'll show you what I mean like that. So there's at the top, the supernal triad is Ipsissimus, 10 degrees equals 1. Number 2 was Magus, 9 equals 2. And number 3, Bina on the Tree of Life, Magister Templi, 8 equals 3. 
Then the next order is the R order of the RC and the babe of the abyss is that area between the supernal triad and uh, the rest of the tree. Adeptus exemptus, 7 equals 4. Adeptus minor, 6 equals 5. Adeptus major, 6 equals 5. Adeptus minor, 5 equals 6. Then below that is the order of the GD. And the veil of that is Dominus Liminus, the link. Then comes the grade of Philosophus, 4 equals 7. Practicus, 3 equals 8. Zelator, 2 equals 9. Neophyte, 1 equals 10. And Probationer, 0 equals 0. Crowley lists them, and even before Probationer, he just says student. His business is to acquire a general intellectual knowledge of all systems of attainment as declared in the prescribed books. And there's a curriculum. Crowley led, uh, wrote up a curriculum which uh, was a very thorough liberal arts education in comparative religion and magic. Uh, uh, pretty thorough for uh, the 1920s when he wrote that. The next grade is probationer, zero equals zero. His principal business is to begin such practices as he may prefer and to write a careful record of the same for one year. Simple as that. Neophyte. He has to acquire perfect control over the astral plane. Zelator. His main work is to achieve complete success in asana and pranayama. He also begins the study of the formula of the rosy cross. Practicus is expected to complete his intellectual training and in particular study the Kabbalah. Philosophus. And remember, that's four equals seven. Philosophus is expected to complete his moral training. He is tested in devotion to the order. Dominus Liminus, that's that veil, the link between uh, the order of GD and the order of uh, uh, RC. Uh, let's see. Dominus Liminus is expected to show mastery of Pratyahara and Dharana, concentration exercises. Adeptus without is expected to perform the great work and to attain knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. Adeptus within is admitted to the practice of the formula of the Rosy Cross on entering the College of the Holy Ghost. Adeptus Major obtains general mastery of practical magic, though without comprehension, and Adeptus Exemptus completes in perfection all these matters. He then either becomes A, a brother of the left-hand path, or B, stripped of all of his attainments and of himself as well, even of the Holy Guardian Angel, and becomes a babe of the abyss, who, having transcended reason, does nothing but grow in the womb of its mother. It then finds itself master of the temple. Magister Templi, whose functions are fully described in Liber 4.18, as is the whole uh, initiation from Adeptus Exemptus, and he says, see also, aha, his principal business is to tend his garden of disciples and to obtain perfect understanding of the universe. He is a master of samadhi. Magus, number two. 
attains to wisdom, declares his law, see Libra 1, Vel Magi, and is the master of all magic in its greatest and highest sense. Ipsissimus is beyond all this and beyond all comprehension of those lower degrees. Wow. Obviously, that's serious stuff. Obviously, uh, uh, this isn't something that you just show up on a Thursday night taken around a temple and been declared these things. You actually have to achieve these levels of awakening. In the mid-1940s, Carl Germer, a key administrative officer of the OTO, wrote Crowley asking for a definitive statement regarding the difference between AA and the OTO. The following is Crowley's reply. The difference between AA and the OTO is very clear and simple. The AA is a sympaternal institution, entirely secret. There is no communication between its members. Theoretically, a member knows only his superior who introduced him and any person who he himself introduced. The order is run on purely spiritual lines. The object of the membership is entirely simple. The first objective is the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. The next objective omitting considerations for the present of the six, uh, six equals five and of seven equals four, is the crossing of the abyss and the attainment of the mastership of the temple. This is described very fully, especially in Libra 418. Much less is written about the five equals six degree, uh, the knowledge and conversation, because it is too secret and individual. It is impossible to lay down conditions or to describe the experiences involved in detail. The OTO has nothing to do with this except the Book of the Law and the Word of the Aeon are essential principles of membership. In all other respects, it stands by itself as a body similar to Freemasonry, but involving acceptance of a social and economic uh, system which is intended to put the world on its feet. There is also, of course, the secret of the ninth degree, which is to say the weapon which they may use to further these purposes. Signed 666, September 16th, 19. 46. Let's see here. I'm going to finish the chapter up today. OTO. In contrast to the AA, the OTO, Ordo Templi Orientis, operates publicly and semi-publicly in a manner not too dissimilar to modern Freemasonry. In fact, its founding father, Karl Kellner, was a high-grade Austrian Mason who uh, patterned the basic structure of the OTO after the Blue Lodge, Royal Arts, Council Princes of Jerusalem, Rose Croix, and Kadosh degrees of Continental Freemasonry. Kellner traveled widely and was fascinated with the magical practices of the East and Near East. Reportedly, during one of his Burton-esque pilgrimages, he met three adepts who progressively revealed to him a series of powerful magical techniques of a sexual nature. He th when he digested the full implications of this information, Kellner saw that this secret of secrets was the key which unlocked the mysteries of both Freemasonry and Christianity or the Christian mysticism, anyway. He wasted no time in incorporating this revelation in the higher degrees of his local lodge. In 1902, the existence of the OTO was revealed in Oroflama, a, a German Masonic publication, 
and it was announced that the order had taught the secret of sexual magic. Crowley was given leadership of the OTO in the English-speaking world in 1912, reworked the degree rituals to conform with Liber Alva and the Law of Thelema. An excellent history of the order is outlined in the Equinox Volume 3, Number 10. That's the Blue Equinox. And I encourage anyone interested in the OTO to review it. OTO membership does not of itself confer any status in Freemasonry. In recent years, this has led to confusion among the less informed brethren of both institutions. The following is an official statement from the OTO's website, which should clear up any misunderstanding. Quote, Nearly 100 years ago, when the OTO was established in Germany, it was closely allied to several rites of European Freemasonry. However, in October of 1918, owing to the unique religious teachings of the OTO, Crowley determined it appropriate for the OTO to sever all Masonic ties and formally renounce any claim to make Masons. At that time, while retaining the use of certain convenient customs and terminology used in early Freemasonry, Crowley revised the OTO rituals, insignia, and modes of recognition to avoid infringing upon the legitimate privileges of the established and recognized authorities of modern Freemasonry. Further revisions along similar lines have been implemented implemented in more recent years. Despite some similarities between names and titles used within the OTO and the names and titles used in Masonry, various churches and other organizations, conferral of any degree, rank, office, or status within the OTO does not constitute conferral of any degree, rank, office, or statue, status in any other active organization, Masonic, religious, or otherwise, any more than the rank of sergeant in the Salvation Army equates to the rank of sergeant in the U.S. Marines." Unquote. Ordo Templi Orientis is more active today than it ever was during Crowley's lifetime. It has official bodies in 17 countries at that time, I think it's 25 now, and provides degree initiations, Gnostic masses, and an assortment of public and semi-public events, including Crowley's Rites of Aloysius. The OTO is without question the most visible Thelemic organization on earth. There is no doubt that the series of dramatic rituals which comprise the OTO initiatory degrees can have a lasting and profound magical effect upon the candidate. It is also true that fellowship with other Thelemites can be a rewarding and satisfying experience. But, as we mentioned above in our comments about the AA, the real work is done by the individual. No one can reveal a real secret to you. No one can project enlightenment upon you. If you expect affiliation with any organization is going to lighten your magical workload, you are mistaken. And if you're waiting for a teacher who embodies perfection, or a group in which there are no jerks, you'll wait forever. Below is a portion of one of Crowley's letters which first appeared in Magic Without Tears, which briefly outlines the system of the OTO. And this is Crowley. What is dramatic ritual? It is a celebration of the adventure of the god whom it is intended to invoke. The Bacche of Euripides is a perfect example of, these, of this. Now in the OTO, 
the object of the ceremony being the initiation of the candidate. It is he whose path in eternity is displayed in dramatic form. What is the path? One, the ego is attracted to the solar system. Two, the child experiences birth. Three, the man experiences life. Four, he experiences death. Five, he experiences the world beyond death. Six, this entire cycle of point events is withdrawn into annihilation. In the OTO, these successive stages are represented as follows. One, zero, degree Minerval. Two, first degree, initiation. Second degree, consecration. Third degree, devotion. Fourth degree, perfection and exaltation. Six, PI or perfect initiate. Of these events or stations upon a path, all but uh, number two, that's in, uh, initiation, are singular critical events. We are, however, concerned mostly with the varied experiences of life. All subsequent degrees of the OTO are accordingly elaborations of the second degree. Since in a single ceremony, it's hardly possible to sketch even the briefest outline of the teachings uh, of initiates with regard to life. The rituals five through nine are then instructions to the candidate how he should conduct himself, and they confer upon him gradually the magical secrets which make him master of life. Unquote. While the OTO, while Ordo Templi Orientis is a magical and fraternal organization, within the order's matrix can be found a jewel, which offers all aspirants a unique and beautiful medium for the Thelemic, for Thelemic religious expression. It is the central ritual of the OTO, public and private, and it is the mass of Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica. And that's chapter 13, which we will start tomorrow. Until then, continue to be good to yourself. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Do something that grows. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love and your will.